Zayd, when he got given those two options, he looked at his father and then he said, Bal indaka. He said, I want to stay with you, to the Prophet. So then his father and his uncle, both of them, they say, Wayhakaya Zaydu. Zayd, woe be to you. Atahtarul Ubudiya ta'ala al Hurriya. Are you going to choose slavery over what? Freedom. وَعَلَىٰ أَبِيكَ وَعَمِّكَ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ And are you going to choose somebody else over your father and your uncle and your family members? وَأَقُولُ قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ وَالْمُصْطَفَ الْهَادِي وَلَا أَتَأَوَّلُ الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve every single one of you and may Allah tabarak wa ta'ala uh, allow me to inshallah ta'ala be able to uh, cover this uh, lesson today uh, correctly and in a way that pleases him subhanahu wa ta'ala Last lesson, we were talking about Nabila Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's da'wah. We categorized his da'wah in Mecca into how many types? The da'wah in Mecca, we divided it into how many? Into two, mashallah, Allahumma bari. What was the first one? Da'wah sirriya. And da'wah sirriya, what was it? What does it mean? What's... So privately, secretly, the Prophet was given da'wah. So we were, we were speaking about that. And we also mentioned the Islam of a few people. We spoke about a few people that embraced Islam when Nabi Muhammad came uh, with his message. And who was the first to embrace Islam and accept Islam? Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Who is Khadija? Khadija is the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. She's the wife of the Prophet. Who is the second person we said took Islam? Ali Abi Talib. Question. Why was Ali in the Prophet Sallallahu house? Because that's how he accepted Islam, correct? So what brought Ali ibn Abi Talib to the Prophet's house in the first place for him to embrace Islam? Yeah? I can't hear you, Habibi. Abu Talib was going through a difficult time, hey? Sah? Correct. So it was a time of drought and uh, hunger, and uh, two individuals made a decision to go to Abu Talib and uh, take some of his children. Who is it? Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib and who? Nabila Muhammad. So when they came to uh, Abu Talib and they said, We will take your children to uplift the burden from you. It's a drought, hunger. You can't look after all of these children. You have many children. Let's take a few of your children. He said, leave one child for me. Don't take this child. Who is it? Aqil. He said, don't touch Aqil. The rest, if you want, you can take any one of them. So who did uh, Abbas take? Abbas, he took Jafar. Jafar grew in the house of uh, his uncle, uh, Jafar, uh, sorry, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And uh, Ali ibn Talib, he grew up in whose house? Our messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Today we're going to talk about the Islam of Zayd ibn Haritha. He's another person who took Islam very early. Zayd ibn Haritha was the servant of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. It's, it's important that we avoid the word slave. We avoid that word for a reason, because that word slave has a meaning that doesn't go in line with what the Sharia means by, by the word a mawla. And you'll understand it in this hadith, inshallah ta'ala. So terms can be a bit tricky. People can understand. That's why some people, when they say, you should be a slave of Allah, I think that's not a fair translation of the word slave, right? Be a slave of Allah. 
that translation, I don't think it's accurate. Because a slave comes across as someone who is forced, who is abused, who is not happy, content. But we'll see, inshallah, a different story when we look at the nusus of the Qur'an and the Sunnah that the believer, to be a abd for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is he happy? Are you all happy to be abd for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah? You are. It brings you happiness and joy. and you, you, So the term's important when it gets trans, translated. But again, tomorrow you might hear me say again, uh, let's be good slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's important to keep that in mind that the word may not be the best translation for it. Ala kulli hal. Zayd ibn Haritha, he was a mawla, servant of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And they say he is the first of the servants to accept Islam and to embrace Islam. And he was called Zayd ibn Harith. He was known as Hibbun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A person who the Prophet really, really loved. And the Prophet loved him so much that the Prophet called him after himself. He called Zayd ibn Harith after himself. He said, your name is Zayd ibn Muhammad. Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, that's your name from now onwards. He had that name for a period of time in Medina and in Mecca. He had, uh, he had that name. How did Zayd ibn Haritha and the Prophet come into contact? What brought Zayd ibn Haritha to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam? Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi mentions the story. Tirmidhi mentions in his jami' And he even graded the story to be authentic. And Imam Al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah. Ibn Ishaq also mentions it in his sirah. This is the story. Al-Hakim ibn Hizam. Who knows who Al-Hakim ibn Hizam is? Does anyone here know Al-Hakim ibn Hizam? Al-Hakim ibn Hizam ibn Al-Huwaylid. So who knows who he is now? Huh? He's a relative of Khadija, but how would he be related? What's Khadija's name? Khadija? Khadija? Binti? Khwailid. And his name is called Hakim ibn Hizam ibn Khwailid. He's going to be the nephew, right? So he's the nephew of Khadija. So he came from Sham. Then he came to his auntie uh, and he had a, a few servants. From amongst them was Zayd ibn Haritha. Uh, he entered onto Khadija and he said, Auntie, Ikhtiri, choose whichever of these servants you want, choose them. It's yours. Fakhtarat Zaydan, she chose Zayd uh, uh, from amongst the, the children that was shown to her. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I want you always to focus on Khadija. Khadija was a very smart woman, extremely smart, a unique individual, haqiqatan. Khadija is a unique individual. If you read the seerah, you look at her judgments, the way she thought, the way she did things. Khadija displayed maturity. She displayed intellect. She displayed it at the highest level. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. She specifically chose Zayd from amongst the Ghilman. And when the messenger saw Zayd, he was fascinated with him. Some of the scholars, they took from this that Khadija, her skills were very good at telling people's body languages. The personality, the way they carried themselves, the way that they were, she could tell. Very sharp in that regard. Again, she's a, a very extremely uh, wealthy woman. She comes in contact with so many different people. So this is a must for her. She needs to know this. Who she can trust, who she can't trust, who can she do business with. So Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she chose Zayd ibn Haritha. She chose him. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa he saw Zayd, the narration mentions when the Prophet saw him, he loved Zayd. And Khadija said, You know what? Since you really like him, 
you can have it. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was given Zayd ibn Harith, Zayd ibn Haritha, the Prophet freed him. He said, you're a free person. But I want you to take my name. And Zayd took his name. So from that day onwards, he was called Zayd ibn Muhammadin. I mentioned the benefit last time that some of the aima, some of the great scholars pointed out that Zayd ibn Haritha is the only individual from amongst the companions whose name is in the Quran. And I told you the wisdom of why his name is in the Quran is because he was stripped from the title of being called Zayd ibn Muhammad. It was an honor. He was one time walking the streets of Mecca with the name of Zayd ibn Muhammad. And at one point when the ayah came down, Ud'uhum li When that verse came down, he no longer is now called by that name. You can imagine being named after the Prophet and then that being taken back from you, how hurtful that could be. Sah? But to replace that pain and to give him reassurance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him in the Quran. Abu Bakr is not mentioned in the Quran by name. Wala Uthman, Wala Ali. He's not mentioned. Like in Zayd's mentioned in the Quran. Are we all together, brothers? This is very important. And until as long as the Quran is recited, that verse is read, Zayd's name will be said, will be mentioned. Are we all together, brothers? So it's a lesson and a benefit we take in life. But sometimes Allah might take something away from us, but replace it with something else that is good. Something that you love and you truly admire might be taken away from you and Allah might replace it with what? Something great. So Zayd is now called by this name. His name is Zayd ibn Muhammad. وَذَلِكَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ this was before the revelation came down. By the way, Zayd ibn Haritha, his father hasn't seen him for a long, long time. He's heartbroken. There's a few lines of poetry he read. He said, Bakaytu ala Zaydin walam adri ma fa'al. Ahayun fayurja am ata dunahu al ajal. Fawallahi ma adri wa inni la sa'ilun. And in lines of poetry of pain, he said, Bakaytu ala Zayd, I cry over my son Zayd. I don't know what he has done and what has been done to him. Is he still alive? Is he alive so I can hope to meet him one day? Or has death come to him and now he's no longer alive? He's making these painful statements. فَلَمَّا عَلِمَ when the father came to know and know be Mecca he came to know that Zayd ibn Haritha is in Mecca he came he, they told him your son he's known where he is he's, he lives in Mecca he lives with a man by the name of Muhammad in Mecca so Haritha and his brother Haritha and his brother meaning Zayd's father and his uncle both of them came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and they said to him, Yabna Abdil Muttalib, Yabna, Yabna Abdillah, the son of Abdullah, Yabna Abdil Muttalib, the son of Abdil Muttalib, which is another benefit that we take from it, which is a person can be named after their granddad. Shar'an, it is permissible for you to call yourself by the name of your granddad. Because the father, the granddad is what? He takes the position of a, a father. So in other words, we're allowed to school ourselves by a father's name or a granddad's name or a great granddad's name so we can in, omit our father's name out. It doesn't go against it because the jad is considered a what? The granddad is considered a father. Father. No. So he called him by these names, Yabna Hashimin, Yabna Sayyidi Qawmihi. He's praising him by calling him these names. Arabs' lineage is a very important thing for them. To know a person who his father is and who his father's father is and is important. So the fact that Haritha is mentioning all of these names, he's trying to soften the Prophet's heart. And then he said, Ibn Sayyidi Qawmihi, you are the son 
of the leader of the people of Quraysh, يعني عبد المطالب. أنتم أهل الحرم. You are the people and the custodians of the Kaaba. وجيرانه عند بيته. تكفون العاني وتطعمون الأسيرة. جئناك في ابننا عندك. You guys, Quraysh. You guys are the ones who take care of the people who visit the Kaaba. You guys are the ones who feed them. You take care of your neighbors. You guys are known to be very caring and kind. He put that all as a muqaddimah. And then he said to him, I came for the sake of my son. My son is with you, Zaid. He's my son. He said, Famnun alayna. Bestow your favors upon us, Muhammad. Wa ahsin ilayna. Be good towards us. Allow us to take our son back. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man huwa, who is he? Qal, he said, Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd is my, I'm his father. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called Zayd. And he said, In shi'ta fa'aqib indi. Zayd, you have a choice. You're a free man. If you want, you can stay with me. In other words, I'm not going to get rid of you. And if you want, you can go to your father. Wa in shi'ta fa'antalik ila abika. Go to your father. This is why I said, don't use the word slave. Zayd, when he got given those two options, he looked at his father and then he said, Bal indaka. He said, I want to stay with you to the Prophet. I want to stay with you. <clears throat> and I'm not going to choose anyone over you. You are like my father and my mother. To the Prophet So then his father and his uncle, both of them, they say, ya Zaydu. Zayd, woe be to you. Are you going to choose slavery over what? Freedom. If you come with us, you're a free man. And if you stay with him, you are? You're a slave. وَعَلَىٰ أَبِيكَ وَعَمِّكَ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِكَ And are you going to choose somebody else over your father and your uncle and your family members? قال نعم. He said, yes, I will. إِنِّي قَدْ رَأَيْتُ مِنْ هَذَا الرَّجُلِ شَيْئًا This man, I saw so much from him. مَا أَنَا بِالَّذِي أَخْتَارُ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدًا أَبَدًا I am not going to choose anyone over this man. نبي الله محمد. فَلَمْ يَزَّلْ زَيْدُ عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم زيد remained with the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام حتى بعثه الله تعالى until Allah sent زيد until Allah sent نبي الله محمد as a prophet فصدقه he believed in him straight away وأسلم and he embraced Islam from him وصلى معه and he prayed with the prophet فأنزل الله عز وجل and then Allah sent down the verse ادعوهم لآبائهم that verse came down Telling the messenger, you can no longer call him by Zayd ibn Muhammad. Then the Prophet وسلم, he told him that your name goes back to your father's name. And then he said, Ana Zayd ibn Haritha. I am called Zayd ibn Haritha. There are benefits that we can take from this uh, story. Many, many benefits. The things that we take from it is, brothers, is that the people the household members, if they testify to your nobility, your, your household members testify to how good you are as a person, how righteous you are, is very profound, right? Because Zayd lived with the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, I saw so much from this man, and it's so much good things I've seen from him. صح? I have seen good dealings from him. So the Prophet ﷺ had any good akhlaq towards him, right? Islamically, this is how they were, the great imams of Islam. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, listen to this one day. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, a righteous man. He was married to Fatima bint Abdul Malik, صح? Fatima. Her father was a ruler, her brother was a ruler, her next other brother was a ruler, her husband is a ruler. She's from a rich family. Rulers after rulers. So when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz married her, he told her, 
This, and he was a rich man, very rich man, Abdul Malik, uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Very wealthy, had so much money. But when he got, when he took over the leadership of the Muslims, he changed. He changed. So one day, a woman entered onto Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and Fatima. So, sorry, she entered onto Fatima, sitting somewhere. When she saw Fatima sitting somewhere, there was a man in the room and Fatima wasn't wearing a hijab. And said, she said to her, Fatima, what are you doing? Why are you sitting here? Because the man was fixing the house and he was, he, he was working on the house and fixing the house. And so they, the, the woman said to her, why are you not wearing hijab? Why are you not uh, covering yourself in front of the ma this man? And she cried and she said, this is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, my husband. This is what? My husband, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He was working with the maid, the servant, in doing the fix in the house. They said about Uthman ibn Affan and his servant, you would never know the difference between them, the way they used to dress the food they used to eat, the lifestyle that they had. Yeah, and you read Islamic history and the way things were and the way that they dealt with people. There was no human rights overlooking their actions. And they knew Allah wa ta'ala was doing muraqaba in the way they dealt with other people. Now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go into the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu his daughters, they hastened to Islam. And without a doubt, they saw their father, what type of person he was, and what kind of individual he was. They knew he was steadfast and upright. They knew that of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu reached Islam. Every single one of them embraced Islam. The Prophet uh, his daughters, every single one of them embraced Islam and every one of them. And that's what Ibn Ishaq mentions. He said, وَأَمَّا بَنَاتُهُ فَكُلُّهُنَّ أَدْرَكْنَا الْإِسْلَامَ All of his daughters reached Islam. فَأَسْلَمْنَا وَهَاجَرْنَا مَعَهُ And they migrated with him. Then comes the Islam of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr, his name is, ooh, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to test and see, inshallah ta'ala. I hope this doesn't offend anybody. But I'm going to ask you this question. I want to see who knows Abu Bakr's name. Some of you are thinking, isn't that not his name? I thought it was his name all along. Abu Bakr was his actual name. But I want to see, so Alhamdulillah, the ones who already put their hands up, I know those, those who I'm not going to pick. The people who put their hands up are the ones I'm not going to pick. So I'm going to pick the ones who didn't put their hands up when I ask the question. Don't Google. Don't Google it up. Hey, yeah. what, what is Abu Bakr's name? Hey, yeah, brothers. I know there's a lot of brothers who know it, mashallah. But I, I want... Put your hand up, be honest if you don't know it. Inshallah ta'ala. Put your hand up if you don't know it. Because I have an idea. Okay, good. And put your hand up if you do know. And what about the rest? Uh, yeah. Who's, who put their hand up and said they know? Uh, Abdullah ibn Uthman is his name. Abu Bakr's name is Abdullah. Is that, that was simple, right? Okay, from now onwards, everybody remember that. His name is Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Amir al Qurashi at Taini. So his name is Abdullah. That's his actual name. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. A man like Abu Bakr deserves for us to know his name, right? Huh? Wallahi, we should know Abu Bakr. 
Abu Bakr, after all of the prophets, he's the best man. All the umam, all the nations that came before, he's better than every one of them, except the prophets. The prophets are only better than Abu Bakr and the messengers. Are we all together, brothers? Abu Bakr is heavy on the scale in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should go out of our way to learn about who he is. So today, inshallah, let's leave with this benefit. His name is Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Amir is his name. At least those three, memorize it. Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Amir is his name. He and the Prophet sallallahu they meet in terms of tribe. Where? Does anyone know where they come into each other? They're all Quraysh. All the four Khulafat Rashidin were all Quraysh, Quraysh. But they, so who's the, from the four rightly guided Khulafa? Who was the closest to the Prophet alayhi Put your hand up. Yeah, yeah. Habibi. Yeah, you. Ali is the closest to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Sah? Who is second? Yeah? Yeah? Uthman is second. Sahih. Yeah, who is third? From the four Khulafa Rashidin. We're talking about tribe wise. So Ali is closest. Uthman. Yeah? Who's, who's next? Yeah? Umar and Abu Bakr, who's closer? Hey, who believes? Put your hand up if you think it's Umar. And if you think, think it's Abu Bakr, put your hand up. <laughs> yeah? Uthman comes from Bani Adi and he comes Bani Tain. Who is closest? It's been mentioned in the, in the room. The two views were mentioned, but it's homework, inshallah. Find out, inshallah. I need you guys to look at that up and find out. Look at the tree of the Prophet and where they all come in from the Prophet. So, this, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, his name is called what again? Abdullah ibn Uthman ibn Amir, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is the first man to embrace Islam. Ali was young, but he embraced Islam from the men. He knew the Prophet's truthfulness and he knew uh, how reliable he was, how honorable he was. One of the great qualities of Abu Bakr, which are many, is Uthman came into Islam through Abu Bakr. Imagine that. Imagine how much reward Abu Bakr gets from bringing Uthman into Islam. Allahu Akbar. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas came into Islam through who? Abu Bakr. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf came into Islam through whose hand? Huh? Abu Bakr. I mentioned to you Uthman. Abdul Rahman ibn Awfin, and they're from the 10, ten promised Jannah alive. They came into his, with whose hand did they come into Islam? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr gets the reward of these two men. Every righteous deed that they do, Abu Bakr has a portion of it. Without the reward being reduced from them. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he trusted and believed in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi There was a time, there was a conflict between Abu Bakr and Umar. They fought over an issue. A little fight happened between the two of them. So, Abu Bakr realized that the mistake is on his side. He realized he did the mistake. So he went to Umar and he said, Umar, forgive me, I am sorry, I shouldn't have done it. Umar said, no, I'm not going to accept it from you. They rejected it. He said, no, I'm not going to Forgive you. Now listen to this story because this story is very profound and it teaches us lessons in many different fronts in life the way that we should be. 
Abu Bakr, as soon as he realized that he did wrong, he asked Umar for forgiveness. Umar refused. I want us to think of ourselves in the way that, in the way that we are. You ask somebody for forgiveness. First of all, for you to acknowledge that you did a mistake and you wronged somebody, Allahumma barik, that's, that's, that's a good sign, right? And then for you to go to the person and say, it's my fault, please forgive me. That's another one, that's, that's something else. And then on top of that, the person rejects it from you and says, no, I'm not going to forgive you. And you go to someone to intercede on your behalf so that they can forgive you. That is Abu Bakr. He asked, he acknowledged his mistake. He went to Umar, he said, forgive me. Umar refused. He went and he went to the Prophet. What to tell on Umar? No. To get the Prophet intercede for him and to speak to Umar to forgive him. So he went. The Prophet ﷺ, he knew his companions very well. He knew them very well. Are we all together brothers? And I want you guys to understand the way that the Prophet's relationship with his companions was very unique. It was a relationship where they didn't just learn the revelation and everything with him. They lived their life of seeing how to live as a Muslim. So, so he was part of their life. He was part of their growth and everything. So they were getting tarbiyah. That's why a lot of us, we don't have that. We seek knowledge, but we don't get that tarbiyah side. Because it's missing from us. No, we didn't get that. So when we learn information and knowledge, we, ser we turn out to be a way that is not pleasant or good. What did Umar radiallahu anhu do? Sorry, Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr went to the Prophet. As he's walking, the messengers with his companions, he sees Abu Bakr walking from far. Then the messenger وسلم, says to his companions that he's with, he said, Amma sahibukum faqad ghamar. As for your friend, and he's referring to who? Abu Bakr. He said he has gone into a heated debate and a discussion with somebody. Allahu Akbar. He knew it. He said, Abu Bakr, today is not in his normal state. He has, he has gone into a heated discussion with someone. Then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr come into contact. Abu Bakr reaches the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, إِنَّهُ قَدْ وَقَعَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ بْنَ خَطَّابِ شَيْءٍ Me and Umar had a conflict. فَتَدَرْتُ إِلَيْهِ I hastened to him for forgiveness and he refused to forgive me. Ya Rasulullah, speak on my behalf and please tell him to forgive me. As they were talking, something else is happening in the background. Umar radiallahu anhu realizes himself and says, how on earth did you just tell Abu Bakr to leave? Who came to you and asked you for forgiveness? I'm going to go to my brother and, and say, I forgive you. Sorry. So he went to the house of Abu Bakr. His wife opens the door. He says, where's Abu Bakr? She goes, he's gone. Now she doesn't know where he's gone. But he knows Umar. Who else is he going to go to? Ah. The messenger is alive. There's no disputes or disagreements except they take it to the messenger. So he goes, he's to the, he went to the Prophet. Umar makes his way to the Prophet as he's coming to the Prophet. The Prophet now is different to how he was when Umar, when Abu Bakr was walking towards him. The Prophet is now different to how he is when Umar is walking towards him. Umar walks from far. The narration mentions mentions The Prophet's face changed. The Prophet became very angry. Brothers, listen. Abu Bakr is still standing up. He saw the Prophet's face. He saw Umar coming from far. The narration mentions Abu Bakr threw himself on his floor, on the floor with his knees. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, Anna Lidi Badatu. I am the one who started the conflict. My brother Umar didn't do anything wrong. Allahu Akbar. Look at the level of the Sahabas. He said, I was the one who started the conflict. I am the one who did wrong. The Prophet was already angry. He didn't want to hear what Abu Bakr had to say. 
He waited for Umar to come. And the minute that Umar came, the Prophet said the following words. The Prophet said, not Umar alone. He addressed the entirety of his companions, all of them. And he said the following words. He said, I came out with a message. I was... At the beginning, I claimed and I mentioned I'm a prophet sent from Allah. All of you disbelieved in me. Every single one of you. Abu Bakr straight away said, you're true. You're telling the truth. He believed in me straight away. Abu Bakr. When Nabi Muhammad said, uh, he said, I'm a prophet sent from Allah. Abu Bakr didn't even say, let me think about it. He said, I believe you. You are telling the truth. The second time this, something similar like this happened was the night of Isra al Mi'raj. When he was informed, they came to him, Quraysh, and they said to him, Do you know what your friend, Nabi Muhammad, is claiming? And he said, What is it? They said, He's telling us that last night he went from Medina to Bayt al Maqdis, and from Bayt al Maqdis, he went high up into the air. He saw all of this and he came back, all of that in one night. Abu Bakr said, did he say that? He said, yeah, that's what he said. He said, well, if he said it, that's the truth, it happened. And that's the level of Abu Bakr. That's why he's called a Siddiq. So the Prophet went on to say to Umar and all the other companions, Abu Bakr believed in me. Abu Bakr believed in me when you guys all chose not to. Not only that. وَوَاسَانِي بِنَفْسِهِ وَمَالِي Abu Bakr, he took his nafs and his entire family to take care of me. The, the time when the Messenger ﷺ left from Medina and he was making his way from Mecca, sorry, and he was making his way to Medina, who played the entire service of the Prophet ﷺ. It was Abu Bakr who was with him. It was Asma bin Abi Bakr who was bringing the food. And it was Abdurrahman ibn, ibn Abi Bakr who was, look, he was looking out for the Prophet. Abdurrahman, by the way, at that time was not a Muslim. If my, my memory serves me correct. He was looking out for Quraysh because they put a bounty on the Prophet's head. So Abdurrahman was looking out for the Prophet, the son of Abu Bakr. Asma was bringing the food. She ripped her cloak, she put it on her neck, and she was climbing that mountain that the Prophet and her father were in, and she was bringing the food. Look what the Prophet then said. Are you guys not going to leave my companion as though the rest are not companions? Are you guys all not going to let Abu Bakr, are you guys not going to leave him alone? Abu Darda was the narrator of that hadith. He said, from that day, from that day, Abu Bakr had a station amongst all the companions. No one dared to ever speak back to him. That's who Abu Bakr is. Abu Bakr, he brought his father, Ibn Abi Quhafa, Uthman. He brought him to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Are we all together, brothers? This is the level Abu Bakr reached. Abu Bakr, the people who hate him, Tabbalahum. Abu Bakr is a noble companion. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he went and he brought his father, an old man, white bearded. And he brought him to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Uthman sat in front of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam to take Islam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Abu Bakr, why didn't you tell me? I would have went to Uthman's house. And why would you bring this old man to me and your father? The Prophet said, you should have told me. I would have went to him. I would have given him the bay'ah of Islam in his house. When Abd Uthman stuck out his hand and he placed it in the palm of the Messenger Alaihi Salatu Abu Bakr started to cry. 
He cried heavily. Do you guys know why he cried? The reason why Abu Bakr cried was, he said, Ya Rasulullah. His whole life was about the Prophet He said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, I know you would have wished today that person whose hand you're shaking is Abu Talib. I know you would have loved Abu Talib to have embraced Islam. His father is secondary for him. He, for him, is the Prophet and anything that's close to him. I know that you would have loved if it was Abu Talib whose hand you were shaking and embraced Islam. That's the type of person Abu Bakr was. He gave everything for Islam and for the Messenger So brothers, do not know his name. For us, for us not to know his biography, and his life and what he's accomplished Abu Bakr and what he did is not a good thing on our side. Yeah? It's not a good thing. So Abu Bakr embraced Islam very, very early. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith. He said he believed in me when the rest of you guys, you refused to. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr, when he took Islam and he embraced Islam, Ibn Ishaq mentioned, I'm going to read the kalam of Ibn Ishaq. He said, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ أَبُو Bakr, When Abu Bakr embraced and took Islam, أَظْهَرَ إِسْلَامَهُ Abu Bakr mentioned his Islam openly. وَدَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَإِلَى رَسُولِهِ He called to Allah and his messenger. Abu Bakr. وَكَانَ أَبُو بَكَرٍ رَجُلًا مُؤَلَّفًا لِقَوْمِهِ Abu Bakr was a person he, was a, he had a good station amongst his people. They had high regards of him. They saw him as a very simple, easy person. And they saw that his lineage was very high. There's a story when Abu Bakr embraced Islam. They kicked him out of the Kaaba. He used to pray in the Kaaba and he used to cry. And the women and the children would go by and they would see Abu Bakr praying in the Kaaba, crying and tears coming from him. So what did they do? They said, don't pray in the Kaaba. You are causing our women and our young kids and our family members be affected by what you're reading. All of this is causing problems to them. Get away from the Kaaba. So Abu Bakr packed his bag and he was about to leave. One of the men in Mecca, if my, who knows his name? Is it Abu Dij, Abu, huh? Huh? Ibn Dughanna, he saw Abu Bakr leaving. He said, what are you doing? Packing your bags and leaving. Where are you going, Abu Bakr? He said, I'm no longer welcome in Mecca, my land, my place of birth. He said, a man like you, we, we can't kick out of Mecca. A man like you, we cannot watch you. To, we can't let you leave Mecca. You're going to stay in my house. You're going to stay in my house and live with me. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to pray outside on the balcony. And he used to pray. And he used to pray so much. Uh, in, not the balcony, but the front porch. He used to pray there. And then the neighbors and the family, they complained again about Abu Bakr. His salah, his ibad, and his tool al-qiyam. But the thing with Quraysh was Abu Bakr was one person they used to turn a blind eye from. They would not say things to him. Because he had very good manners. He was a man of his people. And he was part of the people's problems. He was, he was a member of the family, people. They didn't see him as an, somebody who thought he was better than everybody else. Whenever things were needed, he was like, come on, let's do it. Let's make it happen. That's important. That's what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was so they didn't harm him. I'm going to mention the people who took Islam on his hands. I forgot as Zubair ibn Awam as well. From the people that took Islam on his hand is Uthman ibn Affan, Zubair ibn Awam, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Talha ibn Ubaidillahi, 
These all are promised Jannah alive. Every single one of them, they took Islam on whose hand? Abu Bakr. Even Abu Bakr paid the money to uh, Abu Jahl to let Bilal free. He, whether, whether it was money, whether it was intercession, whether it was his voice, whatever he could do, Abu Bakr, he did it. And there's many other people that took Islam on his hand. I'm going to stop there, inshallah ta'ala. Anything I've said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are both free from it. Let's take some questions from the ground, inshallah ta'ala. Please keep your questions to the topic, inshallah ta'ala. Please don't go outside the topic. Keep your questions within the topic, inshallah ta'ala. I know. Idols. So they wouldn't pray inside, as in like inside the Kaaba. They wouldn't pray inside the Kaaba. They would pray outside the Kaaba. But yes, you're right. There was idols. Even when the Prophet was praying in Mecca, there were idols. So yes. I know. No, this was, that dispute was not personal between the two of them. That was after the Battle of Badr. After the Battle of Badr, the 70 that were taken as captives, what should be done with them? Abu Bakr had an opinion and Umar had another opinion. Umar believed that these 70 captives that were taken, all of them should be uh, killed. And he said to the Prophet ﷺ, everyone, take your own family member. So give Fulan his family members, Fulan, give me my family member, oh, deal with my ones, everybody deal with their own. And the Prophet and Abu Bakr had another opinion, which was, no. These 70 will be sold back to the non-Muslims for money. Because the Muslims, they need to build those themselves and they need finance. And then the ayah came down, uh, where Allah wa ta'ala rebuked the Prophet and Abu Bakr in what they did. Allah says, مَا كَانَ لِنَبِيَّ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُ أَسْرَى حَتَّى يُثْخِنَ فِي الْعَرْضِ يُرِيدُونَ عَرَضَ الدُّنْيَا وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ That's good. No. Faddal. I can't hear you. I'm growing old now. Abu Bakr and the Prophet, the age difference was about two years, تقريباً. And between him and Umar was 10 years. 10 years between Umar and Abu Bakr. As for Uthman, I, my memory, I can't remember. Does anyone remember the age gap between? By the way, this age issue is a phenomenon that didn't really exist at that time. Sah? Our, either our parents or our grandparents if you ask them when they were born, they would say to you, yeah, maybe that year or that year. Sah? Sah? This issue of age is not common. Uh, I remember when I was studying in Saudi Arabia, some of the scholars, they mentioned that when they wanted to apply for the university or school, school, they didn't know their, their births because they were born in no hospitals. So then they had to create a birth certificate for themselves and in order to, uh, to start school. So, so the phenomenon of age, and it's, it's got its benefits and it's got its harms. Somebody would say, I'm only 18. So, I'm still young. Who is, the, who is the general of the greatest army of Islam 
when Nabi Muhammad was passing away. Hey? Osama, the son of who? Do you know how old he was? There's a view that says he's 16. It's all a view. Are we all together? 16. Wow. This is the biggest army Islam has had at that time. Qawlan wahidah. There wasn't, they're fighting against the Romans. Who's the general? Put your hand up if you're 16. If you're younger than 16, put your hand up. Allahumma barik. Say Allahumma barik. <laughs> I can see your brother with a white beard saying it. MashaAllah. <laughs> so yes, 16. You know, I was, I was looking at a mas'ala. I was looking at a mas'ala, which is when as a side benefit. Ali Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim mentions in his A'lam al muqiin and also Shatibi and his Muwafaqat. When the Prophet passed away, alayhi salatu wasalam, who took over? Abu Bakr. Osama was still in charge, right? What did Umar suggest? Yeah? What did he change? First, he came, Abu Bakr came into power. What were the things that he requested from, he asked him to do, to do? One of the things Umar suggested was to change what? Osama. Why did he say change Osama? He said he's too young. Somebody else in charge, who's more experienced, who's more learned. Huh? Correct? What was the response of Abu Bakr? Yeah? He was sticking to the text. He was like, I'm going to stick to the, what the Prophet did. I ain't going to change that. Maybe Allah Muhammad put something there and I take it down. Okay. Abu Umar's response was what? Look at that. Look at that. Maslah. Okay. Text. Maslaha, this came up very early, صح? Did it come up early? So I thought this is good research to look at. The good what? The fruitful. It's important to look into, صح? Because we always hear that, right? Someone saying, Qala Allah. Another one saying, Maslaha, ya akhi. So who's right, who's wrong? It's good to look into. Or are they both right? And no one's wrong, صح? Lidalik Shatibi mentions this is a maslaha here being looked at, which somebody was observing, which is Umar, and he was doing his ijtihad on that. And Umar Abu Bakr was doing his ijtihad on this. But that's his benefit that you guys can look into. So I think that. People get tricked with is that the number is young 16, 17, 18, and even 19. It's young, but the mindset was totally different. A man who the messenger can trust to take that, brothers, it, it, this is it's not just the army is the biggest army, but they're fighting the, the superpower of that time. The Romans were the superpower of the time, they were the superpower. So, some of the scholars they mention. The hikmah, the wisdom behind why the Prophet selected Osama ibn Zayd, which was, it was to kind of show them how ba'if they are. This boy is going to do it for us, inshallah. And it's a no'u min al-hazimah. It's a no'u hazima. You're going to feel weak. Are you guys as ask this number? You're going to send a little... Yeah. Our youngsters, this is how they do it. Huh? And that was the confidence that the Prophet ﷺ had, which is an important point I want to bring. The way that children get nurtured is vital from a very young age. The mindset that we raise our children with. Yeah, and we don't raise our children in a selfish mindset. We raise them. They take the responsibility of this deen. We raise them for that. That this deen of yours, no compromising. You have to know your religion. You have to hold on to your deen under any circumstances. We have to raise them like this. So Osama ibn Zayd, inshallah, I'm gonna, his story is going to come. I don't want to go before it. Inshallah Ta'ala has written for me the benefits in his life and who he was and why the Prophet selected him and the views regarding that. 
and the strongest opinion of what his age was. I believe he's 16. That's the view I strengthen. And I'll mention that as well, inshallah ta'ala, the qualities that he had. And when the Prophet appointed him, the way that the Messenger emphasized for him to be in charge. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. This teaches us, just one benefit I'm going to mention, is in Islam, there isn't the concept of once you reach that level of puberty, you're a man. Brother, you're a man. This is how the Islam looks at you. Accountability. Are you mukallaf? Yes. Mukallaf means you've reached puberty and you have sanity. If you reach the age of 15 or 14, you reach puberty. Brother, you and I are the same. Me and you are the same. But what we do is, if the, he's 14 and he's reached puberty, or he's 15 and he's reached puberty, we still say, Akhi, he's a young adult. We, we categorize it in a way where we're still keeping him in that mindset that he's still young. Huh? We should, our kids should uh, grow out of McDonald's versus Burger King, huh? and grow up to, to realize responsibilities and by the way, this doesn't... If the Sahaba saw me, and a lot of us, I know mashallah, some of you guys are strong and tough like that, but they would be appalled by our lifestyle, huh? the way that we are, the discipline, our routine in life. Huh? And Islam came to build three things, body, mind, and soul. Huh? Every day you wake up, there has to be a level of today, this is for my body. So this is my workout. This is my diet. That's body. Mind. I've read this much book today. I'm, I'm nurturing my mind. The mind gets hungry. It needs, just stop saying the body needs it. You have to have read something beneficial. And then there's the soul, which is the deen. Every day that goes by, if you're not nurturing those three, it's going to dehydrate. The body's going to either dehydrate. If you don't give it water or food, so it's, it's not nice that you woke up today and you didn't read anything. Are you, are you, uh, by the way, when I say read, it doesn't always have to be Islamic stuff. No, it doesn't. General knowledge as well. I'm talking about knowledge, read things. Get a book and read. Reading is better than watching 50 documentaries. Some of you are like, yeah, I get my knowledge from documentaries. It's good, don't get me wrong, it's good. Documentaries are good. But read. The reason I say read, brothers, is because the brain is given the freedom to imagine. That's what it strengthens and enlarges the mind. Anyone who's read a book in primary and in secondary, and I don't want to mention some of the wrong books that we read when we were young, but then those books got flipped into movies. Those people who watch the movies will say to you that the movie was not as good as the book that we read. Sah? But the book is always better. Reading is always better. The words, it gives you the ability to imagine things. It enhances your mind. It allows your brain, it stimulates your brain. That's needed. Look, brothers, I was... I was reading a quote. Uh, Aristotle, okay, he's not evidence for us. He said something to Alexander the Great. He said to him, I was just sharing it with, the, with the brothers today, the benefits I was collecting. He said to Alexander the Great, if you conquer a land and you open a city, don't look for the rulers. Look for the people who write the music for them. For he is the ruler of that land. Wow. Another, I read another quote by an uh, English Orientalist, David Samuel Margulis, he said a statement. He was a deep Orientalist, fed so much adawa against Islam. Baha Hussein, who then adopted his ideology, it's common. He came out of the Laudian professor of Arabic in Oxford University. Alakullin, he said something. He said, if the British have to choose between India that they're colonizing and Shakespeare, they should choose Shakespeare over India. 
Why? He said their civilization is connected to their language and not to the land that they conquer. They saw the importance of language spreading. Huh? Are we all together? Abu, was it Abu Uthman al-Mazini? A man came to him and he said, I'll give you 10,000 dirhams. Hash, I'll give it to you. He was a non-Muslim. When the time of Islam was the top, Arabic was so expensive. If you wanted to learn it, you had to beg. He came to Abu Uthman al-Mazini and he said to him, please teach me Arabic for 10,000. He refused. He said, I don't have the money. Do you know how much that's worth today? Over a million's worth. Just to learn Arabic language. Anyone who spoke the Arabic language at that time was seen as what? Are we all together? Just recently I came across the British Council in this country offers some English courses for free. Spreading English for free. Huh? So you, an Arabic language is very rare for you to find, to study it. Are we all together, brothers? Always remember that that is where the taqwa comes from, language. Lugha. وَلِذَلِكَ The minute you take on a people's language, everything that they believe, they can pour it into you. Are we all together? Abdul Malik ibn Qurayb al-Asma'i, he said, ثَلَاثَةَ أُحْكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِالْدَنَاءَ Three people, if you see them, straight away judge them as dim-witted and dullard, unless it becomes clear to you they're not. And from those three he mentioned was what? If you see a person who speaks Persian in an Arab land, he speaks English in an Arab land, what we do right now. He said, consider them, in a land of the Arabic language, English or another language to be spoken there, they were against it. Are we all together? Now these things, are, of course, they need to be looked into and of course the timing and the the place that we live in and everything needs to be understood more. I need you to understand that you are now seeing a Muslim who is being Muslim for all his life and he doesn't know anything from the Quran. He doesn't understand it. If your father was a billionaire today and he wrote you a letter in a language you didn't know, what would you do? And he's dead. He just passed away. And you can see some numbers there. Like, you know, like dot, comma, zero, zero. You can see that there's some money there. But it's in a language you don't understand. It's your dad's signature and everything. What would you do for that note? Yeah? Huh? You would try to find out what your father's saying in this letter, right? You wouldn't even trust one person's translation. You're like, bro, you might be lying to me. So you would go to so many, how many tafsirs would you go to? To understand what your father is saying. So many, right? What about the speech of Allah? In it is your salvation in this world and the hereafter. It's collecting dust. You don't even know what it, what's in there. What it means, huh, brothers. So, it's important that you build those three, body, mind, and soul. Every day, tick off those things. I've, my diet is good today. I haven't had junk. I haven't also done this. I, mashallah, I'm signed up in this gym. Or I'm, or I work out at home. I lift some stuff. That's one. That's the body. The mind, I've read this. I've read that. Mashallah. And your children. Your children. Just yesterday, I finished a book. 100 and something pages, funny enough. So it's talking about, uh, it's, I was reading, it's in Arabic. It's called Tiflun Yaqra. Because I wanted to see, encourage my children. They memorize every day and they, they do all these programs. But on the weekend, they see it as like a weekend that's going to come up. Allahumma bari, we're going to have a lot of fun. So they don't do anything unless it's the studying hours. So I was thinking, how can I encourage them to just enjoy sitting down and reading huh? without it being part of the program? So I read this book to just get some benefits from it. How can you make your child learn to read? And not even that, but love to read. 
honestly, brothers, there's a lot of benefits that were in there. That's for another time and another. But the point I'm trying to say to you is, if you have children, encourage them to read. Gift them on it. This book, if you finish it, I'll give you this. And a child who reads versus a child that doesn't read, you can generally tell the difference. You understand? You can tell the difference of their mindset, the way where they are. Again, when I say read, I don't mean Islamic always. Sah? It doesn't always have to be Islamic. It can be general knowledge, history, this and that. So much different things that the person can read. Medicine and whatever you want. All of those are beneficial to them. And Allah knows best, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa bihamdi. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله استغفرك وأتوب إليك